this webinar reviews the opportunities for Vietnam and the Philippines to transition to 100% renewable energy. And in many ways, it couldn't be more timely. Um, the economic stimulus package to respond to COVID-19 offers a really unprecedented opportunity to combine recovery programs with a clean energy transition, um, both in these countries and elsewhere. Um, we'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, and in fact, all the lands on which we're um, from which we're joining this webinar. Um, and in my case, uh, joining from Melbourne, um, in particular to the Wurundjeri people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be joining us here today. This webinar is being put on by the Australian German Climate and Energy College and the Energy Transition Hub. And my name is Rebecca Burton. I'm the Managing Director of the Energy Transition Hub. Uh, I'd like to note that the webinar is being recorded um, and the slides and the recording will be made available on our websites after the event. Uh, during, the, during the seminar, um, I'd also invite you to submit questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the chat function and writing your question there. Um, and if at the same time you could raise your hand, it will flag that you have a question that we can come back to at the end of the presentation. Uh, at the, um, in the discussion time at the end of the presentation, I'll invite you to read out each of your questions. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. It's fantastic to have Anna Chapman and Dr. Ursula fuentes Hupfer speaking today. Um, Ursula, Ursula and Anna are researchers at, the, at Climate Analytics Australia and also at Murdoch University in Western Australia. At Climate Analytics, Anna is a climate and energy policy analyst and Ursula is a senior climate policy advisor. At Murdoch University, Ursula is an adjunct, adjunct associate professor who also leads the project under the Energy Transition Hub. Anna and Ursula's work focuses on development of climate policy and energy transformation strategies in the Asia Pacific region. And they've done a number of papers. Um, so Ursula, I'll pass to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your introduction. And um, so I will share the screen with the presentation. Yes, so um, we will be presenting um, the recent uh, briefing papers we have done under the, the project that Rebecca um, referred to under the Energy Transition Hub um, that focuses on uh, opportunities uh, for cooperation with South Southeast Asian countries. Um, and the recent work that we've done uh, focuses on Vietnam and the, and the Philippines. So I will start with a brief introduction, um, an overview of um, the project, um, and then going into this recent uh, briefing paper on Vietnam, and then um, Anna will follow with a briefing paper on the Philippines. Um, so this particular briefing paper on Vietnam um, uh, was um, written um, um, by Anna um, and myself, and also our colleagues, uh, Tanya, Tanya Umi, also from Murdoch University, who unfortunately couldn't uh, join us um, today uh, to present this also with us and uh, Kaitlin uh, Shem who has uh, also worked on a paper specifically on Vietnam. So um, the project um, um, that uh, started something like two, two years ago or so um, under the Energy Transition Hub um, focuses on cooperation opportunities on um, focusing on renewable energy expansion for Southeast Asia and opportunities for collaboration uh, with Australia, um, but also um, at state level. Um, why, um, why is that? Why that focus of this project? Well, Southeast Asia is, uh, of course, a region, um, a neighboring region to Australia, and there are very close uh, ties, trade and political ties between Australia and Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia is a very dynamically uh, growing and developing uh, region uh, with uh, a consequence of very high growth in energy demand, in particular electricity demand. Um, so um, very challenging in terms of um, the decisions to be taken for the energy system uh, and therefore also globally relevant in terms of emissions growth, greenhouse gas emissions, um, and uh, the needs to achieve sustainable development goals and opportunities for cooperation uh, in this context. So uh, the idea is to look into um, the opportunities for the region and for individual countries, and then also analyze how um, uh, specifically Australia could cooperate 
uh, both in terms of policy cooperation, but also in terms of technology and uh, export opportunities for, for renewable energy, which is one of the themes um, that uh, is being worked on under the hub um, and has also been presented uh, here. Uh, so we have uh, published one briefing paper covering the whole region and then also Indonesia and the recent ones now Philippines and Vietnam. And uh, we are planning to work also on uh, further papers in this area and also including some quantitative scenario analysis focusing on cooperation at state level with Western Australia. So as I said, Southeast Asia, huge growth in, in demand, in particular electricity um, linked to this economic growth, urbanization, electrification, which is still an issue for many people uh, in, in, in countries in the region. Um, and currently uh, very largely uh, dominated by fossil fuels um, uh, with a significant fraction, in particular coal and a significant fraction of global coal uh, capacity growth coming from this region, which is um, a, a huge challenge and risk to achieve Paris Agreement goal um, globally. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, also a large potential for renewable energy, both in, regi in the region, um, but also from uh, opportunity for collaboration with Australia, with vast potential um, that we see um, that we have uh, in Australia and some projects already um, uh, developing in terms of um, exporting either through um, uh, electricity uh, connection or through uh, export of, of uh, green hydrogen. Now, um, moving on to Vietnam specifically, uh, Vietnam is, is uh, within this region, um, one of the countries with, a, with uh, particularly high growth, uh, economic growth, there's also population growth, but um, really very dynamic economic growth and very energy intensive economy. One of the most energy intensive economies uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, yeah, with a vast, uh, very fast development uh, also over the past uh, decades, um, just recently achieved electricity access um, for the uh, whole country. And with this has uh, also turned uh, or moved from be being a net energy exporter, um, which it was in the past, to uh, now being a net importer um, um, because of this vast uh, growth uh, in demand, which then also leads to a very fast increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and Vietnam also is one of the most vulnerable countries to, to climate change. Um, it is actually also currently working on updating the um, the uh, the NDC target, the contribution to the Paris Agreement. We don't know yet whether it will be really a, a more ambitious target, uh, but it has been uh, yeah working uh, a lot also on uh, climate um, uh, policies uh, also at the sectoral level. Um, but as I said, the challenge is with this uh, huge uh, growth in energy demand, um, it's still um, currently very much based on expanding fossil fuels um, and energy demand mostly uh, is increasing in industry and transport sectors with a very energy intensive industry sector, as I said, and uh, electricity demand is, even, is growing even faster than overall en energy demand by an average of 8% per year, so that's, that's quite staggering. Um, and coal is, um, yeah, mostly imported uh, currently. Coal use uh, very much for the power sector, but also um, a lot in the industry sector. And currently investments are um, going not only into expanding this uh, coal uh, pipeline, but also uh, uh, investments in gas infrastructure. Um, however, uh, Vietnam, as I said, um, it has a, a greenhouse gas emissions target, um, like many countries in the region, uh, defined against a, a very um, sort of generous business as usual pathway. Um, but it also has targets uh, and policies um, related to energy efficiency, electrification, rural electrification, um, and also expansion of renewable energy. 
which is an area that we have looked at uh, specifically um, in this briefing paper and then also uh, more in depth in a paper that was published uh, by Kathleen um, and, and um, some of us in the team uh, in the Energy Policy Journal um, last year, where we looked in depth into the development of uh, policies um, in, the, in the area of renewable energy. And uh, what we see is uh, currently in, in terms of renewable energy, it's mostly small hydro that uh, Vietnam relies on. There has been uh, some success in expanding wind energy already with um, some of the policies introduced. Um, and the other source that is traditionally also um, relatively strong is, is biomass. Uh, but solar energy has really only developed um, recently. However, um, and that, that is quite an, uh, encouraging with um, the development of policies, in particular the feed-in tariff. Uh, there has been really a huge surge just in the last year uh, in terms of solar installation. Um, so starting to tap into a very large potential uh, for solar energy in the country that is um, that until very recently has been basically uh, an untapped. Um, but that is starting. So, th so that is um, that is an encouraging development. Uh, but still, there are a lot of gaps and barriers that we have um, also summarized in the briefing um, and analyzed in, in the paper. Um, and that also has to do with the with the geography of the country, where it is a challenge to balance uh, supply and demand in terms of um, energy uh, infrastructure. So there's a strong there's a need in investment into transmission uh, grids to to um, to address this um, but also the overall consistency of policies um, the still existing also indirect fossil fuel subsidies um, uh, and um, the the uncertainty in, uh, for uh, private market uh, and private investors um, to invest into uh, large-scale renewable energy projects Um, yeah, so on the other hand, what we see when we analyze, <clears throat> we, haven't, we haven't done um, any specific um, scenario development ourselves for Vietnam, but we have analyzed the literature and existing uh, scenarios and projections for Vietnam. Uh, and what we see is that while currently there's the strong investment in gas and coal, and there is an encouraging development also in, in, in terms of uh, policies and starting investments first in wind and now recently also in solar. Um, the potential for renewable energy that exists um, and the figures here are from a recent study by uh, Sventeske and others from uh, Sydney um, University. Um, there's a large mainly uh, widely untapped uh, potential for solar energy, for utility solar energy for also for wind energy and in particular for offshore wind. Um, and a, a range of scenarios shows both uh, projections done uh, with the, um, the industry ministry, the Vietnam ministry and the Danish Energy Agency. They have, they're, they're doing projections every, every two years. They show that scenarios with a large investment in renewable energy uh, really can benefit um, in, also in terms of cost effectiveness. Um, apart from all the, the benefits for sustainable development in terms of um, reduced air pollution uh, and also access to uh, rural areas, um, access to, to clean energy and electricity. This is also um, supported by um, scenarios by, the, um, by APEC um, that are also published every, every second year and by the recent study that I referred to by Sven Teske and, and some other scenarios that have, that have um, been published recently. Uh, and, and this really um, shows that, um, that the, um, this area, um, looking into a systematic shifting of investment uh, and the opportunities for, for enhancing investments into, into renewable energy um, is still a, a very broad field. Um, and a lot, much of this uh, still untapped. And in the context, of course, of the current situation, um, uh, looking into um, stimulus programs and response uh, to the COVID crisis, 
uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, where Vietnam, of course, is doing um, better than many other countries. Uh, and Vietnam um, is also already starting to develop um, economic stimulus packages. Uh, and the figure here is from a recent survey by IMF. Um, but currently, as, as far as we can see, um, there's no specific focus of in, in terms of the stimulus package to look into the opportunities for green investments or for, for connecting um, this need for investment uh, uh, with um, the potential for investment into green technology. So this would be an area um, that is worth exploring. When we did the briefing paper, that was before the COVID crisis. So that is, that is um, of course, something for, to look at in future. But what we looked at uh, in the briefing um, was what, are, what, does, what does it mean for opportunity for collaboration between Australia and Vietnam? Um, and this is something that we have seen also with other countries that we have looked at in the region, that there's this strong focus, of course, currently in Australia uh, in terms of collaboration in the energy space, um, of looking into collaboration with fossil fuels or export opportunities for fossil fuels. And of course, coal and export of coal for, uh, into Vietnam is, is one of the focus areas. And there's not much evidence of specific collaboration with Vietnam in the space of renewable energy. Of course, there's other collaboration also in terms of development cooperation, but not focused on renewable energy. Um, whereas other countries like Europe from the European Union um, or others uh, like the US have um, very targeted projects in the area of renewable energy. And we see this really as an area of large uh, potential to expand this cooperation, building on the existing very close political and trade ties, but refocus it on this huge potential for efficiency and, and clean energy uh, investments. Um, so, yeah, that is the conclusion that we that we draw for this country, which is also similar with uh, for other countries, um, and and the future export opportunities, uh, both in terms of a transition line uh, which exists currently, there are projects for transmission to Singapore and and Indonesia. Of course, Vietnam is in a different uh, space that would be linked to the regional uh, transmission uh, cooperation within the ASEAN countries. Um, and in future, also the opportunity to import uh, green hydrogen, given uh, the large needs also for the industry sector in Vietnam, that would be something to look at in, in, uh, in, a, in a future uh, potential collaboration uh, that is currently not yet uh, the focus, um, as I said. So with this, um, I would like to stop my presentation, hand over to Anna to look at uh, Philippines, and then we can go into questions and discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ursula. Yeah, um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, um, I'm presenting on a recent paper by um, Ursula, uh, Tanya Ermi, who's uh, not here today, and myself, uh, which is published on the Energy Transition Hub website, um, titled Energy Transition to Renewable Energies, Opportunities for Australia's Cooperation with the Philippines. So the key messages of the presentation is that um, the Philippines is vulnerable to climate change. It has power outages, numerous islands and increasing energy demand. Um, so there's a need to diversify and de decentralize the power system, transitioning to renewable energy and storage. Um, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of ensuring access to secure and affordable energy. And to date, the Philippines has reported more than 10,000 cases and 600 deaths from COVID. Uh, renewable energy can help Philippines meet its um, Paris Agreement target, coupled with benefits of um, meeting sustainable development goals. And Australia is well placed to support renewable energy in the Philippines, but there's barriers to renewable energy that have to be removed and investment towards fossil fuels needs to be redirected. Um, to renewable energy. So uh, as some background to the Philippines, the energy security is very important as there's quite a few electricity outages in 2019 and coal fire generation hasn't coped with intensifying energy demand and um, environmental vulnerabilities and the goal for electrification underscores the necessity to decentralize and diversify uh, to renewable energy with storage, energy efficiency, um, 
to improve the capacity for supply to meet demand. In addition, with the COVID crisis, um, you need secure and affordable energy as the workplace, as workforces shift to working from home. And the Philippines has two major electricity grids. There's another 132 small isolated island grids powered by diesel generators. And uh, there's some islands with no electricity supply and many without access to 24 hour electricity. This Philippines energy system is at a crossroads. Um, the total primary energy supplies, mostly fossil fuels, which accounts for 63%, and renewables account for 37%. And renewables, as you can see from the pie chart, is mainly geothermal and biomass. Uh, the Philippines is a net fossil fuel importer, and energy imports cover nearly half of the primary energy supply. Um, it's dependent on imports of oil for the transport sector and coal for power, and which creates an energy dependence on global markets and prices, and recent events have shown how much these prices can fluctuate. Uh, Department of Energy has recognized um, there is excess coal plant capacity creating grid instability by displacing peaking plants that should balance supply. Coal-fired power plants risk stranded assets and increased emissions. So many renewable energy projects remain in the bureaucracy process trying to get permits and approvals. So the uptake of renewables is hindered by these processes. Um, and the demand is then met with fossil fuels. Our paper uh, looked at total primary energy supply projections from the Department of Energy in comparison to the projections by Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC. Um, the Department of Energy had a business as usual scenario which depicts the energy sector without further policy intervention um, and also a clean energy scenario which shows a ramp up of renewables. In both scenarios, oil and coal supply a lion's share of energy in every year. And by 2040, in both scenarios, renewables represents a lower share of the energy mix compared to historical levels of 2016, um, following current trends uh, of a decreasing share. The APEX scenario, scenarios are more ambitious. They show higher rates of renewable energy percentages for all years and scenarios. The TGT or target scenario is developed to show a pathway for aspirational target of APEC of tripling renewable energy generation capacity by 2030 and reducing energy demand by 10% by 2030. And the 2DC or two degree scenario aims to increase renewable energy to reduce energy intensity and CO2 emissions sufficient to provide a 50% chance of limiting the average global temperature warming to two degrees by 2050 in combination with worldwide efforts. Um, all scenarios show that Philippines remains, will remain highly dependent on fossil fuels, with fossil fuels representing over 60% of total primary energy supply to 2030 and 50%, sorry, 60% to 2030 and over 50% to 2040. This is in contrast to the need to decarbonize the energy systems uh, globally by 2050. So the Philippines has uh, energy and climate targets for electrification. There's uh, the Department of Energy aims for 100% uh, electrification by 2022, but this is for grid accessible households um, and for 2040 for off-grid households. Uh, electrification is hampered by the many islands, the terrain, the weather and climate factors and renewable energy microgrids and off-grid standalone systems can offer a solution here. The renewable energy target um, aims to triple renewable energy capacity from 2010 to 2030. Another recent target has been introduced to increase renewable energy to 20 gigawatts by 2040. Um, and following the APEC target and two degree scenarios would both meet these goals. The efficiency targets reduce aggregated energy intensity by 25% in 2030 and 45% by 2035 from 2005 levels. Um, the Paris Agreement target for greenhouse gases is 70% emissions reductions below business as usual by 2030, and this is conditional and international support. Um, and I guess part of the paper, it, we're, we're suggesting that um, Australia can step up and, and help coordinate with this. 
Um, so focusing on the renewable energy policies, there's the Renewable Energy Act in 2008, um, aimed to increase the development and utilization of renew renewable energy sources. Um, and it included a renewable portfolio standard, a feed-in tariff, a green energy options program, and net metering. The portfolio standard mechanism requires electricity industry to source a, a specified fraction of energy from renewables for on-grid energy. And uh, the feed-in tariff intends to accelerate renewable energy by reducing the risk of buying solar PV or other renewable energy by offering a fixed price for renewable energy to be fed back to the grid. Um, and that's in compliance with the portfolio standard. The green energy option aims to empower energy users to choose renewable energy so end, end users have uh, a choice of their energy source. Net metering is where distribution utilities can enter agreements with end users who install renewable energy aimed at small scale PV generation um, and deductions from electricity bills. The feed-in tariff and net metering, although mandated in the Renewable Energy Act in 2008, were actually delayed until 2012 uh, for the feed-in tariff in 2013 for net metering. And media reports suggest that um, this means that the milestone targets for 2020 won't be met, which was uh, 12.8 gigawatts of renewables. Um, the Department of Energy aims to move away from the feed-in tariff with a new green energy tariff program, which is uh, due to be released in 2020. The program has a price cap determined by the Energy Regulator Commission. The green energy auction facilitates competition for procurement of renewable energy. So in terms of investment, uh, the President Duterte signed Executive Order 30, which established Energy Investment um, and Coordinating Council, which simplifies approvals and permit processes. Um, the idea is um, that any energy projects of national significance where projects are uh, worth over 70 million US dollars are processed in 30 days. Um, but the department takes a, a technology neutral approach. But there has been investment in non-renewable hydrogen energy growing uh, in the Philippines and businesses have taken a turn to divest away from coal um, Recently, a large conglomerate, um, Ayala Corporation, announced it would offload all coal-fired power development um, by 2030. And the Green Energy Tariff Program plan for 2020 is expected to spur further renewable investment. The initial phase included uh, 2,000 megawatts and $2 billion auction. But, uh, a recent report by the IEEFA uh, has listed opportunities to improve the competitive auction framework of the Green Energy Tariff Program, estimating an investment opportunity through the program to be worth 7.6 billion US dollars um, and 7.6 gigawatts by 2023 and 20 billion and 20 gigawatts by 2030. If this program was to achieve this investment potential, um, in addition to APEX, business as usual projected levels, it takes the Philippines on the pathway more ambitious than the target and two degree scenarios. In addition, um, as has been a response to COVID, the Philippines Finance Secretary has proposed an economic stimulus package. And I noticed that uh, pillar four of the package worth um, 830 pesos, billion pesos, aimed at um, an economic recovery invest, to invest in social and infrastructure programs. So if this is a, appropriately directed, this plan could spur renewable investment and renewable infrastructure programs. Our paper reviews a number of studies that show the potential for renewable energy. Um, here I show the renewable energy potential as reported by the Department of Energy. The Philippines has abundant renewable energy resources and solar in combination with battery storage with microgrids or standalone off-grid solutions, which are key for remote locations. And um, investing in renewables offers many benefits, such as creating a diversified energy supply, higher levels of energy security, and a low carbon society. And 
it also has implications for meeting sustainable development goals. So, um, you know, it can offer clean and affordable energy, which is sustainable development goal seven. Um, Philippines is very dependent on fuel imports, but renewable energy and batteries can offer a cheaper, reliable source of energy. It can reduce air pollution, health impacts, and it can also bring communities together. And our paper shows examples of communities resisting the construction of coal-fired um, power um, as part of sort of a larger battle against corrupt politicians, unemployment, and other issues. We identified in the paper some policy gaps and barriers to renewable energy in the Philippines. Um, in terms of political commitment, there's some support for renewable energy, such as um, the Renewable Energy Act and Green Energy Tariff Program. But support, there's also support for coal, and the government's not really relaying a consistent support message, which gives mixed signals to um, stakeholders. And there's a lack of coordination between and within government departments and institutions. And we found um, the grid has several challenges, especially where the grid is weak or has a low demand. Um, and the priority, priorities of each administration changes, creating investor uncertainty for renewables. Um, and existing policy frameworks don't allow for easy private sector investment and investors face lengthy and complex procedures to acquire permits for renewable energy. And this can um, impact small investor participation. Um, although the, the government has tried to introduce this energy virtual one-stop shop bill to improve these procedures. Renewable energy projects are subject to foreign ownership, whereas thermal power plants aren't. And the Philippines suffers from a lack of capability and resources. Policymakers struggle to determine how our technology advancement um, affect the policy landscape. For example, there's a lack of policy on distributed energy generation, battery storage, floating solar, microgrids, and community renewable energy. And there's a, a, a public perception that coal is cheap and a reliable source of energy, whereas renewables are perceived as unaffordable and unreliable. So we look at uh, options for collaboration between Australia and the Philippines, um, where Australia is uh, well positioned to help with renewable energy projects with its experience in renewable energy to date. In particular, industry researchers and governments of the two countries um, can conduct research to determine a 100% renewable energy pathway for the Philippines with international support and opportunities for renewable energy imports. We can remove barriers to renewable energy uptake and investment and develop options for further renewable energy supported policies. Develop together grid infrastructure and renewable energy capacity building programs. Work jointly on issues related to climate vulnerability and resilience to energy systems. Support research and implement, uh, implementation to help reduce energy demand. And renewable energy based green hydrogen offers collaborative opportunities for a new Australian export. Uh, so in conclusion, I would say the economic stimulus package to respond to COVID-19 offers uh, unprecedented opportunities to combine recovery programs with urgent need to shift investment towards a clean energy transition. And regional cooperation between Philippines and Australia offers solutions to both deal with the immediate crisis, but also set the foundations for uh, a future energy system and developing a partnership between the Philippines and Australia in line with um, sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement targets, Australia can support the Philippines in transitioning to renewables through exploring opportunities for collaboration between the two countries, meeting the energy demand, grid infrastructure, uh, microgrids and off-grid solutions, removal of the policy barriers I discussed and, and policy upgrades for electrification and renewable energy taking into account a high vulnerability to climate change. Um, and for example, Australia has um, a lot of experience with uh, microgrid and off-grid solutions. And although it's not the same in comparison to many islands, it has all these remote locations and expertise in these areas that can be shared. 
opportunities for Australia to export renewable energy, including through hydrogen, uh, to meet Philippines' energy demand and reduce its fossil fuel import dependence. And there's opportunities, the best use cases in the Philippines for renewable hydrogen imports in different economic sectors. And uh, yeah, so that's the end of the slideshow. And um, we'll open for questions. Thank you both, Anna and Ursula. Um, there's so much information there. Um, yes, yeah, so I would invite you all to raise your hands and write down the questions um, uh, as you do so. Um, there are a number of questions, but hopefully we have time to, to get through them all. Um, Roger Dargaville, can we um, start with you? I'll unmute you and invite you to ask the question now. Great. Thanks very much, Rebecca. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you well. Great, thank you. So my question's for you, Ursula, and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you as well, Anna. Uh, but Ursula, you, you showed a slide saying you had uh, 4,500 thereabout, thereabouts megawatts of new solar PV installed in, in Vietnam, and that, that number is quite staggering. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what the incentives were behind that growth in, in PV, and whether it's rooftop or utility scale, and whether you expect that kind of growth to continue into the future. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, indeed, it is quite a staggering recent development. And um, it, I, I don't have uh, the figures in front of me now in terms of exactly the share, but there, there is a large number of large scale uh, um, solar projects um, coming into the grid basically uh, month by month. So that, that is indeed quite a staggering uh, um, development. So it's, it's, it's very much large scale, uh, but the, the, so the policies address both large scale and uh, um, rooftop solar with a feed-in feed tariff uh, scheme um, and also plans to move uh, towards auctioning. So um, I think that that's, that's been a large part of uh, or the central policy really. Okay, and will the trend continue? Well, um, it is continuing. Um, um, yes, it is continuing. I mean, in, in terms of, I guess, the policy, uh, of course, we also have this very strong focus uh, still on um, uh, on coal expansion and also on investment into gas. Um, on the other hand, we are also we have also seen over the past a delay um, in 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 the investment in coal, and it'll be really quite important to see how um, the the next power development plan will look like, um, and how that also plays uh, um, with the continuation of uh, investment incentives um, uh, for renewable energy, and and. Yeah, and the option also of, of uh, enhancing the, the climate target. So, um, so it's not like, um, yeah, I, I, because of this large increase in demand, I guess the, the policy um, is, is not consistently moving towards a shift towards renewable energy, but, but still uh, um, certainly uh, also supporting a growth in investment in, in also in solar now, yeah. Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Um, Siegfried Anghera will um, come to your question now and um, I see you have a number, but because there's quite a few questions, we'll probably just get you to choose one of those. Thank you. I'm actually very happy for you to pick the question and read it out because I've got so many issues as an expert <laughs> in this area. Uh, I mean, there's a number of things I've disagreed with uh, very specifically because I work with the regulators in the in the Philippines, and I work with uh, Vietnam uh, at the government level and policy levels, including other countries in Southeast Asia. You pick the question, and I'll be happy. Okay, great. Um, in that case, of your of your many comments and questions, um, the one I'd probably pick is um, to seek views on how the current Philippine and Vietnamese government energy department positions on centralised coal and gas transition um, relate to the international investment community views on financing those sectors as opposed to um, to others. Generally, the appetite for financing the coal and gas that's envisaged. Right. Um, well, um, 
of course, I mean, uh, Anna can uh, um, also add to that. Um, yeah, as I said, I mean, that bo holds both for, for Vietnam and, and the Philippines. That, um, there has been a very strong focus on expanding uh, coal. But on the other hand, we've already seen, and that was also pre-COVID, we already have seen a delay, um, in particular also in, in Vietnam, um, uh, but but still a, a huge growth and a huge plan for, for um, expansion. And this is of course also driven, uh, so it's, it's driven by uh, domestic policy, but it's also driven um, uh, by investment, um, also from the region and that's um you know if, if you look at uh at uh those who are still um investing strongly in coal uh, like um, japan korea or, or china um so it's often sort of government backed uh investment um but of course the the risks uh, uh of such an investment and uh, um, the risk of stranded assets is becoming more and more um clear and and uh, apparent also for for a number of investors which is which has also led to a uh, a decline or a, a delay uh, in the projects we are also seeing an increasing um um resistance also in vietnam and anna also referred to that uh, in the philippines uh, so i mean on a purely on purely economic uh, on a purely economic basis um it's clear that it's a very um, increasingly risky uh, investments uh, if you look at the cost uh, comparison uh, and and then the future uh, uh, risks um, um, yeah um, for, in terms of the lifetime um, of such an investment um, so it's so it is very much policy driven and the question is I guess uh, how much can that shift and can it shift fast enough if you look at um, objectives uh, of you know sustainable development achieving uh, climate targets which is a huge issue of course both vietnam and uh, the philippines are very very uh, vulnerable to climate change um, so in in this whole mix of policies i guess there is an opportunity for a shift in policy but it's but it's not uh, not clear yet and maybe anna wants to add to that uh, in, um, yeah, also for the Philippines. Yeah, um, well, I, I agree. And um, I one of the big issues is um, a restriction on foreign ownership for renewable energy projects, um, whereas uh, fossil fuel projects just don't face those same restrictions. And so um, you're limiting investment from abroad um giving a an unfair advantage to one industry over the other great thank you um now we have um sam lang wan joining us from cambodia um sam Lang, i'll just try and unmute you um and invite you to ask your question can you um You should be able to talk now. Can you hear us? Would you like to invite your to ask your question? It's wonderful to have you here from Cambodia. No? Okay, I'll see if I can just, um, we might in fact then um, go to, if, if, could I ask you to raise your hands um, at the top of the chat because it makes it much easier to find you. We have quite a number of attendees. Um, <laughs> uh, Thang Do, I'll invite you to ask your question and then I'll just try and find, um, Sam Nang was one and, and read that out myself. Um, but let's go to you, Feng Do. Um, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear yeah. you now. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks. Oh, I have a quick question for Ursula. How will the cooperation between Australia and Vietnam uh, occur? Government to government or business to business? What do you reckon? Thank you. Uh, uh, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I guess um, um, both uh, both is occurring, of course. But as I said, there's not a very um, there's um, um, from what we have seen, not a 
currently a focus in the government to government um, cooperation in the energy space, uh, not a current focus on renewable energy, but um, of course both, but there is a very intensive collaboration and many projects um, in, in general in terms in the area of sustainable development or, or uh, um, on a government to government basis. And then of course the, the business to business cooperation is also very important. Um, and certainly in, 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 in general, um, that is also something that, that the government uh, supports. Uh, and, and I guess that is what we're trying to say that um, this current situation it, it, in principle is a very good basis for um, a very targeted um, uh, look into how this can be enhanced in the space of renewable energy and with a focus um, and really a shift uh, of focus uh, on renewable energy. Um, and I guess, there, I mean, there, there are many areas um, that that uh, one can start um, with um, and that, that ranges from looking, um, you know, collaborating and, and looking into what are barriers for uh, investment uh, and, uh, and what could then uh, be done um, both at the government uh, level and in the in the business uh, uh, cooperation level to to improve um, the investment climate uh, and the incentives for for investment and that can also go into um, specific um, uh, um, um, the specific area of investment by by Australian uh, industry and this can also go into the whole area of uh, where there is a lot of experience and a lot of um, knowledge in Australia. Um, not only with large-scale uh, renewable energy development, but also with um, uh, microgrids uh, or uh, um, remote area uh, development. Uh, so this is both policy and technology and both government uh, um, and business, business cooperation. Um, but then government cooperation can then also support um, uh, improving um, investment environment and incentives for, for business. And Great. just Thank you. to uh, add on, on top of that, um, I think it's um, important for cooperation, yeah, with government, industry and business, and then also the uh, research institutes yeah. um, in both Australia and Southeast Asian countries. Thank yes, th that's a good point, um, uh, and, and I guess that is, and this, this is, um, I mean, one of the areas we've we've worked on in the energy transition hub that, of course, had the focus of bilateral research between Germany and Australia. But it's uh, it would be very interesting to look into this into some collaborative research looking into um, scenarios for transitioning to 100% renewable energy at a regional scale, and 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 what does that mean for investments into uh, you know transmission grids. Uh, technology, but also uh, policy, um, environment, energy market uh, reforms, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I totally agree. Um, so, Sam Lang, I'm just going to read your question. Uh, this is a question for Anna, and it was around um, the definition of non-hydro renewable energy that um, that you used in your slides, and what that what that includes in the case of the Philippines. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I mean, that uh, specific part was referring to um, a quote. I think it was from the IEA, but I'm not 100% sure. I can go and have a look, but um, it'll definitely be in the report published. And um, and I think it was just it was just suggesting that there's growth. Yeah, there's growth in, in renewable energy excluding hydro so that that'll be solar um i think mainly solar solar power yeah. and then uh, biomass um a little bit um i don't know about i'm not i'm not too sure about the you know a tiny bit of wind or other things but um yeah okay thank you um, so we'll go next to Craig Burton. Um, Craig, I'll allow you to talk now so you can invite you ask your question. Okay, hi there. Um, I found this uh, an encouraging um, presentation, um, especially the renewables. 
And so I um, work for the Global Buildings Performance Network, and we're in Malaysia and Indonesia at the moment trying to improve building emissions. Um, from mostly in the buildings, mostly from construction. So my question is, um, how much of the how much of your work um, has involved looking at buildings or solar to do with buildings? So the solar is taking off. Um, is it something they have to put on their roofs, um, or is it separate? That's um, what I'm keen to know about. And anything else you might know about emissions in buildings since it's so high. Um, yeah, uh, um, we haven't really looked um, that much in depth. Of course, uh, buildings, and we, we've also um, touched upon uh, the issue of uh, you know both efficiency and uh, renewable energy um, mm -hmm. as important areas. Um, um, and and both countries do have existing policies and targets there as well. But we haven't really looked in depth into this area. Um, um, as I said, in Vietnam, there's a current development very much of large scale um, solar, but it's also rooftop um, solar. Um, but, but yeah, I, I fully agree. That is, that is, of course, also an area um, that would be worthwhile looking more in depth um, in terms of a more sectoral um, uh, analysis. Um, yeah, also for the building sector. I don't know, Anna. Whether you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, well. Uh, yeah. We've we've not really looked at the sectoral level, and I think the reports cover um, energy efficiency policies uh, more than yeah. we have today, focusing on renewable energy, um, but uh, not an in-depth look at at buildings. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll come now to um, Mohammed, and I'll just. Um, Oh, can I unmute you? Here we go. Would you like to ask your question? Um, I can't. All right. Sorry, Mohammed. I um, can't seem to unmute you. So I'm just going to invite um, Fraser Gibson to ask your question. And I'll just scroll through and find Mohammed's question and read it out shortly, just after. Fraser. Uh, yes, it's Fraser here. Um, it seems uh, your report was commissioned by DFAT and I guess my question was about, uh, do you really, or to what extent, I don't suppose you get much feedback from them, but whether you really think uh, they might take on board some of the tackling some of the major trade and regulatory problems uh, between Australia and also in um, Vietnam and in Philippines. Uh, I suppose one thing we have in common with those countries is that we talk emissions reductions, but but subsidise fossil fuels. So um, uh, I'm just wondering whether, you, you know, how, how do we sort of, or do you think there'll be a, a realistic tackling of those regulatory and trade um, barriers, um, let alone um, to free up the, the investment that would be required? Uh. That, that, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we see, you know, I mean, I guess in terms of um, um, having uh, funded this research, um, that is that is an expression, I guess, in, in, in the interest um, um, in this area. But um, yeah, we, we haven't had uh, any specific exchange yet in terms of the results of this uh, project, which is also still ongoing. So I guess there's there's a potential for, for looking um, into such an engagement. And um, I mean, part of this project is actually also engagement with stakeholders, which we currently have focused um, uh, at the um, at the state level um, here in, in, in Western Australia, where there's um, also an, an interest um yeah again also building on str strong ties in terms of um, um state uh, industry and collaboration with southeast asia but uh, as you say the focus is not is so much on um uh on fossil fuels uh so that yeah the whole the whole framing and the whole narrative is, is so much focused on this that um yeah i would see there is a huge potential but i've Again, currently we haven't seen any any indication um, 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 
of of any willingness uh, you know to 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 shift this um but we would hope that some some this research and other research in this area and um can maybe help um opening up um that debate um and uh of course, we also have seen recently an inter more and more interest in um, this whole aspect of um, export opportunities. Um, and when we look into export opportunities for renewable energy or, or technology or, uh, or products, then uh, often this is uh, countries like Vietnam and, and the Philippines are not the ones that are in focus, right? We're, we're looking more into other countries um, uh, more developed countries like Korea and Japan, and then maybe a country like Thailand or uh, yeah, Indonesia or, or, or Singapore, of course. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of, of you know, any specific uh, changes there, but we would be, of course, uh, hoping that there is an interest in, in, um, in a dialogue on, on the basis of, of this and other research in this area for, to look into these opportunities, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I, I guess that we have to get our own house in order in terms of renewable energy before we um, start exporting it or telling somebody else how they ought to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think I think we just have time for one more question, and I'll I'll read out the question that um, uh, from Mohammed. Um, it, the question relates to what the cost of augmenting a transmission network might be from or developing a high voltage direct current network from Australia um, to either of these countries and whether there has been work done on that and um, in general, I suppose, the feasibility of that. Um, yeah, as I said, no, the, the, um, I don't think that is an immediate option in terms of a direct uh, connection from here. There are, there is a, pro there are, uh, there's a project, um, being uh, developed with a connection to, um, this is from um, Darwin uh, to Singapore and then possibly, um, um, so in, uh, Indonesia and possibly Singapore. So these are projects, there has also been a, a feasibility study for something uh, similar from the Pilbara to, to Indonesia, to, to Java. Um, uh, so in that sense, um, I think this would rather be maybe a, a longer term option and more an option um, in the context of a stronger integration within the ASEAN region. And that is something, so the, the work on an, a stronger integration in the ASEAN region with a, a stronger uh, a transmission grid uh, connecting the different countries within Southeast Asia, that has been something that has been developed um, for quite some time. Um, but actually not for in the beginning at least not that much um, thinking of integrating renewable energy however that focus um, has uh, become more and more interesting also for the region and um, there has been an, a recently an agreement signed between the ASEAN region and and um, the International Renewable Energy Agency um, to look into this uh, improvement of the regional uh, transmission grids to support high integration of higher shares of renewable energy because the potential for renewable energy, um, the, the regions where, they, where there's high potential are often quite far away from where the demand is high. So a larger integration within the region can help um, integrating higher shares of renewable energy. And that's of course quite challenging um, because because of um, yeah, quite different political systems um, within the region and apart from the technological um, challenges. So if you look at that development and any potential uh, connection then between Australia and one country in the region, then that could be something um, interesting for the more distant future. Um, so in the immediate future, maybe the more the national and the regional um, uh, transmission grids um, are, would be more important. But then of course the, the more recent developments from the Australian perspective in terms of exporting um, green hydrogen based on renewable energy uh, instead of a transmission line um, have become increasingly interesting because of the recent uh, cost develop, uh, technology developments and, and cost reductions 
with uh, for electrolyzers uh, and of course that that brings more flexibility but and as i'm seeing also from some comments um, of course this um, you know looking into importing green hydrogen that is not an immediate option for countries like vietnam and the philippines um, it but it could be one part of a solution in a longer term strategy in particular looking really into a, a transition to 100 percent renewable energy um, which could be challenging for some of the countries, also for uh, uh, for Vietnam. So that could be, you know, one module, one option within a bigger picture. But but the immediate focus, um, uh, um, of course, would have to be really tapping into the existing large domestic uh, renewable energy source, and then maybe also into this regional cooperation. But that points to the need for um, a strategic approach uh, and and. And I guess one of the focus areas for such a collaboration, also at the government level, can be uh, collaboration also at, at the strategic level, both in terms of research, developing scenarios, and then um, yeah, developing these strategies. And of course, every country is also uh, supposed to deliver a long-term strategy in terms of the Paris Agreement. Um, so there's discussions about a roadmap uh, here in Australia and, and um, and this is another opportunity for aligning and enhancing collaboration, um, but focusing on these opportunities for uh, transition to renewable energy. Great, thank you, Astra, and thank you, Anna. Um, we're now slightly over time, and um, we um, we have a number of questions that we have not been able to get to. Um, now, both Astra and Anna have some time available if people would like to stay on the call on the uh, on the um, zoom to continue and raise their questions um, but at this point I will also I will call the formal <laughs> time frame, frame to a close um, and um, give you a virtual round of applause for that enormous amount of work and um, that's gone into this, uh, these reports and um, and the seminar that's a, an enormous amount of information and really valuable to lift our heads up out of the Australian context and um, focus on the interactions with Southeast Asia. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I will just flag as well uh, that we have um, more seminars coming up um, and to remind you all to join us for those as well. On the 11th of May, we have uh, Beyond Zero Emissions talking about um, their work related to the 1 million jobs. Um, and then on May the 13th, we have Climate Works talking about its work looking at decarbonisation futures and solutions, actions and benchmarks for a zero emissions Australia um, across the whole economy. Um, so please do join us for those. Um, but thank you again for coming at five o'clock in the evening um, and for all of the fantastic questions and, um, and for your contributions, Anna and Ursula.